Hey everybody, Jazzy here with another Don't Starve Together guide. If you've been playing the game, watching guides on YouTube, or reading discussions on strategy, you have most likely heard about this thing called Rushing the Ruins. In this guide, I hope that I can convey what exactly it means to rush the ruins, why it is so important to consider when you are starting a new world, and all the reasons you stand to benefit from an early trip to one of the most dangerous places in the game. So what are the ruins? The ruins are a series of biomes located deep within the caves. They contain unique mobs, bosses, and structures, as well as resources that are incredibly rare in other parts of the world. I like to think of the wilds as the gateway biome to the ruins. That's the area with tons of pillars and lichen plants scattered around. Past that point, you can start to encounter the ruins proper. To rush the ruins means to make a beeline for these biomes in your first autumn. This means grabbing a light and whatever other basic resources you might need, and cracking straight into the caves. Depending on your luck and world generation, you can typically find the ruins in a matter of days, and an advanced player knows how to locate the chain of biomes that will eventually lead them to the ruins. Now for the million dollar question, why rush the ruins? Wouldn't your first 20 days be better spent mapping out the overworld and learning the location of all important resources before the start of winter? It's an important question, and one I ask myself at the start of every new world. To answer, let's talk about what exactly you can expect to gain from rushing the ruins. First, there's gears. Lots of them. They drop from broken clockworks as well as damaged clockworks, which can both be found here in abundance. The hard truth of the matter is, you might not have clockwork set pieces on the surface. It's likely, but not a guarantee. So if you were planning on having an icebox for your first winter, a fling matic for your first summer, or a fully upgraded WX78 in your first year, then rushing the ruins is your best bet for getting this valuable resource as soon as possible. Second, there's enormous amounts of trinkets to collect, specifically melty marbles and frazzled wires. These can be traded with Pig King on the surface for an enormous amount of gold nuggets which are needed in countless crafting recipes. Can you get gold by mining boulders? Sure. But consider that a single stack of frazzled wires will earn you 200 gold nuggets. That's more than it would take to fill a chest. It's hard to imagine the amount of time it would take to mine for all that gold on the surface. After a single early trip to the ruins, you will not be in need of gold again for a very long time. Third, they're shadow creatures in large numbers. They're daunting at first to be sure, but once you learn to deal with the dark dudes down here, you can collect nightmare fuel at a much faster rate than you would from occasionally being insane. Nightmare fuel is such an important resource for crafting some of the better weapons and armor, and is also used in some other ruins loot that we'll talk about soon. Also down here you will find gems of all six varieties. You will need a single purple gem to craft a shadow manipulator, and if you plan on building the celestial portal, you will need more purple gems to make moon rock idols. You're not getting ice hounds until winter, and very unlikely to get fire hounds until summer. So purple gems are a very limited resource early game. Red gems for life-given amulets will similarly be in short supply, so any opportunity to collect large numbers of these is highly welcome. The orange, yellow, and green gems are used primarily within the ruins, which brings us to the most important resource to be found here, the ancient pseudoscience station. This is an immovable crafting station, which unlocks a number of recipes for extremely powerful items that cannot be prototyped and must be crafted at the station. Most of the recipes call for nightmare fuel and thulacite, a crafting material that can only be found in the ruins. The amulets and staves all require rare gems. Now, I'm not here to talk about everything you can craft with pseudoscience. I want to discuss specifically the items that can benefit you in the early game, which you are most likely to prioritize during a Ruins Rush. First, there's the armor, hands down the best in the game until you get bone armor. The Thulacite Crown is such an important piece of equipment, it cannot be overstated. It absorbs 90% of damage, plus it has almost triple the durability of a football helmet. In addition, every hit from an enemy has a good chance of activating a force field, which will completely negate damage for 4 seconds. This makes the helm irreplaceable in early boss fights where good armor can be very hard to come by. The Thulacite suit is a bit more expensive, but that astronomical damage reduction and durability is worth the price tag. True, a marble suit does reduce more damage, but has about half the durability. So cumulatively, you're going to block a lot more HP with the Thulacite because it will last longer. Not to mention the difficulty in acquiring large amounts of marble early on. To illustrate this damage reduction, take the Bee Queen fight. 
Let's say you wear a beekeeper hat plus a thulacite suit. Every poke from Bee Queen will be reduced down to 6. The suit will absorb 29, the hat will absorb 25, and this combo will be good for about 42 hits. This is unbelievably useful in a situation where you need to tank some hits, and it means you won't need to slam healing food every 10 seconds. What better complement to the best armor in the game than the Thulacite Club? Its base damage is less than a Dark Sword. However, each successful hit has a 20% chance to spawn a Shadow Tentacle, which will deal additional damage to your target. The club has 50% more use than a Dark Sword, so while the superior damage per second is debatable, the overall damage is not. You will dish out way more hurt by the time your club is used up, unless you have a substantial damage modifier, such as Mighty Wolfgang or Volt Goat Jelly. One subtle but significant benefit to this item is the 10% speed boost granted while equipped. You will not find any speed boosting item on the surface until day 21 when you can hunt Mac Tusk for a walking cane, and in the early game, speed modifiers are worth their weight in gold. Speaking of speed modifiers, the Magiluminescence is another excellent item for any player looking to get straight to fighting bosses. It's damn cheap to craft considering the benefits. Sanity, free light, and a 20% speed boost. If you've tried kiting any boss in this game, you'll know that this bit of speed can be a real game changer. Ancient Guardian is tough to kite without at least a 25% boost, but with a combination of Mag and Thulacite Club you can get 30%. Versus Bee Queen, that speed is important during the second half of the fight when you're trying to outrun that Grumblebee charge. When fighting Klaus, I love to throw on a Mag during the last phase when he starts lunging because I can actually dodge the attack with enough speed. The Shadow Rook is the only tier 3 chess piece that can realistically be kited, but you will need around 50% speed boost to dodge the bite. And there's no guarantee that you will have a walking cane by day 21. Versus Dragonfly, the Magiluminescence makes the kiting window way more forgiving. You can't back off too early from her because she'll start flying towards you for the next attack, so the only way you can kite is to dodge her as she's winding up to punch. Having a speed boost means you don't need near perfect reflexes to pull off the dodge. The Magiluminescence is just one of those universally helpful items. Whether you're running around toadstool chopping spore caps, trying to dispatch Fuel Weaver's unseen hands, or sprinting through the deciduous biome trying to locate Klaus's loot stash, this amulet is a tool that should never be downplayed. The last item I would strongly urge you to craft at the pseudo station is the Star Color Staff. Now, in single player Don't Starve, this item casts a Dwarf Star that gives off light and heat for about 2 minutes, and is just not really worth the cost and hassle. Not the case in Don't Starve Together, where a Dwarf Star will last for 28 minutes. That's 3.5 in-game days you don't need to worry about Charlie or freezing during a winter fight. It's really invaluable to have this to light up a boss arena, and will almost certainly last for the duration of the fight unless you're trying to solo Misery Toadstool. I can't remember a time when I soloed any raid boss without a Dwarf Star start burning nearby. Even for general purposes, the staff can easily replace your fire pit. Sound like a waste of gems? Then consider each staff has 20 uses and will provide light for 70 in-game days. That's a year in DST. Not enough time? Then drop a 5% staff into a repaired moonstone during full moon in exchange for a moon color staff which will give you 100 additional days of polar light. For a game where darkness is the big constant threat, the idea that you can potentially get over 100 days worth of light from a single staff might just change the way you look at yellow gems from now on. Now you might be doing some math in your head and realize that, in order to craft a Star Collar Staff and Thulacite Club, you're going to need 5 living logs, which are not the easiest item to find early on. Let's say you chop and dig one totally normal tree, okay? That's 3 logs. How do you craft both Staff and Club from these? Simple. First you craft a construction amulet at the pseudo station. Wearing one of these will bring the cost of the Star Staff down to 1 living log and the Club down to 2. But that's it for the main reasons that generally entice me down into the ruins early on. On. But all these benefits considered, the question still remains. Should you rush the ruins? Are these resources worth the sacrifice of time in that first autumn where mapping out the world and discovering the location of resources on the surface is also really important? The answer is... It depends. You've probably gathered by now that most of these items are geared strongly toward providing an advantage in boss fights, but you might find more value in setting up an early base and stabilizing your food situation. In that case, uncovering the map is more important than the ruins. You might even have time to go look for the lunar island to bring back stone fruit bushes and bull kelp for good winter sources of food. Personally, I strongly prefer starting off worlds with a ruins rush so that I can get to taking down bosses like Bee Queen, Ancient Guardian, Klaus, and Dragonfly, all of which drop unique and very useful items for long-term survival.
Winter cold is not a huge threat once you figure out how to keep yourself warm, which for me is usually wearing a tam shanter and burning the occasional tree to keep a thermal stone fired up. So I'm perfectly content to finish mapping out my world in winter, maybe setting up a few chests at a central location until I can start basing in the spring. There's just so many important bosses to fight in winter, and an early ruins rush means I will be much better equipped to deal with the fighting during this time. Do you need ruins gear to fight these bosses? Definitely not, and there are plenty of speedruns out there that demonstrate as much. But they make the fights a whole lot easier, and much less resource intensive, especially for characters without innate damage modifiers. With anything less than the 90% damage reduction that Thulacite armor provides, you're going to need to spend a lot more time gathering and preparing healing items and armor for these fights. For me, fighting Bee Queen would be a nightmare without the Magiluminescence and Starcaller staff, and would add even more heavily onto the preparation cost. But even the boss fights aside, coming back from the ruins with a handful of frazzled wires, nightmare fuel, and gears will help you out a lot when it's time to start building a base. So there's certainly a benefit for every playstyle to be found deep in the caves. But in the end, the choice is up to you. Hopefully, I've given enough reasons to convince you why it's worth strong consideration to rush the ruins. In the next guide, I'm going to talk about how you can reach the ruins and how to survive and clear them effectively once you arrive. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.